I'd uh, like to uh, like to thank you. I'd like to thank the CCA for this uh, very kind invitation, and uh, I hope uh, you enjoy uh, this uh, seminar as much as I enjoy putting it together. So, uh, what we're trying to do here in this uh, seminar is to take you from the earliest roots of what we know about uh, severe thunderstorms and, uh, and uh, from, uh, from the theoretical aspects, observational aspects, all the way to uh, current practice, you know, what's state of the art practice in trying to predict uh, the occurrence of uh, severe thunderstorms and the things that they bring. And uh, when I say severe, I mean um, high wind, hail, tornadoes, and I um, can't think of anything else, heavy rain. Lightning. Lightning, and also lightning. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a funny thing. I, uh, these are called thunderstorms, but none of these models have electricity in them. So, okay. So let's, uh, let's take a, uh, a look at the agenda. And our agenda is to go back to the uh, sort of the earliest basic building blocks of uh, of severe convection, and uh, and uh, one of the uh, things that I was involved with in the 1980s was looking at how uh, vertical wind shear, ambient vertical wind shear, can affect the type of convection, the organization of convection that occurs, uh, depending on the uh, ambient vertical wind shear. Um, so uh, let's uh, sort of uh, st start out with uh, cumulus convection. Here's, a, here's your uh, basic garden variety cumulus cloud. Um, it's a nice photograph by my colleague uh, Morris Weissman. So uh, this, is a, uh, this is a depiction of the basic cumulus cloud. Uh, something gets the, uh, the air lifted. You know, as the air lifts, it expands adiabatically, it cools. And as it cools, uh, condensation occurs. And the vapor that's in the air turns to liquid. And at a certain point, the liquid falls out down below. And as it falls out down below, it will evaporate and chill the air. Now, I'm sure many of you have had this experience on a hot day. Thunderstorm comes along. And all of a sudden, there's a rush of cool air out of the thunderstorm. And it is because the, uh, the, the rain has evaporated into the air and chilled it off and has uh, caused the air to uh, become heavier. And that, that heavier air, here it comes, here comes the rain, it's chilling the air. You can see from the temperature contours here, that chilled air now creates a, uh, a cold pool, which is uh, known also as a density current or a gravity current. And it's basically uh, describing the fact that uh, the cold air is trying to spread down to its equilibrium level, which is below the ground. So it's just going to keep on spreading under its own weight. So it's basically the same thing you see if you take a glass of water and pour it on the floor. It'll, the dense water will spread underneath the light air and, uh, and get thinner and thinner as it goes. The, uh, the basic life cycle of a uh, thunderstorm like this uh, was discovered back in the uh, it was, was more precisely known in the, in the late 40s uh, during the Thunderstorm Project, project in the United States, uh, taking place in Ohio and Florida, where they had aircraft and, uh, and, and frequent radio soundings to, uh, to be able to uh, describe the life cycle of a thunderstorm. So this is the basic building block of uh, cumulus convection. Okay. And I should say, uh, this is you know, cumulus convection with precipitation is the qualifier. A lot of cumulus convection doesn't, doesn't precipitate. It just mixes out and, and moistens the air above. But we're going to be concerned with severe convection, and almost all severe convection has precipitation. So uh, let's move on to the next uh, slide. Uh, and here, here's sort of the next sort of step in this hierarchy of thinking about severe convection. Uh, it has been uh, observed that when there is uh, a variation of the wind with height, say increasing with height in this case here, that instead of having a symmetric outflow on the, uh, on the thunderstorm, uh, the, this side over here, what's called the down shear side, 
of the uh, cold pool tends to reinvigorate the new cells. And so new cells are then, uh, and when I say down shear, this is, this is, a, this is the wind, and uh, the change of the wind, which is a vector, pointing here in this case from the left to the right. Uh, the wind shear, which is also a vector, uh, the wind is increasing with height. This also is pointing from left to the right. So when I say down shear, I mean with the wind shear. So the down shear side of the coal pool upsets the symmetry that you would have in the absence of any wind shear. You know, my first cartoon was without any wind shear. This cartoon has a wind shear, and with that wind shear, there's a propensity to fire cells up on the uh, down shear side. And we came up back in the 1980s with a simple explanation for that basic asymmetry is that as the uh, coal pool represented here by the dark, um, the dark uh, image here with, with negative buoyancy, and by that as high pressure it's air spreads out, it could also be characterized by a vorticity distribution. Vorticity is basically the average rate of spin of the air parcels at any point. So here we have a has a sort of a positive spin. If, if you take your right hand and put your thumb where the plus sign is, it's the, the spin is in is the spin is into the board. And on the other side, by symmetry, the spin is out of the board. Your thumb points out at you and your fingers give you the sense of the circulation. If you add in this uh, a shear, then that biases uh, this side to produce circulations that tend to fire storms vertically upward, whereas uh, by the same token, it uh, suppresses convection on the upshear uh, side. Um, that's as much as I'll say about that. Uh, going to stronger and deeper shear, one of the things we found is that uh, with stronger and deeper shear, the actual building block becomes different. The, the, uh, the elementary uh, uh, cumulus cloud no longer has a finite lifetime. In principle, it could last for an indefinite time. And this is the so-called supercell. When we get to the uh, supercell, the flow is arranged in such a way as to have the, uh, the, the updraft uh, the updraft, a rotating updraft, propagate in such a way as to always move away from the rain that is tending to, that would have destroyed the, uh, the updraft in the, in the case without shear. So let me take you through a couple of simple, well, there's me. We were out uh, chasing uh, thunderstorms out in, the, out in eastern Colorado. This is, uh, this is several, several minutes before my beard turned white. We, we, saw a tor we saw a tornado that day around the, yeah, this, but I, could, I can verify for you that this form, we chased, you know, we were in our cars looking for tornado genesis out of this rotating, you can see the striations and the rotating cloud here, and this updraft, rotating updraft lasted for hours. We followed it for hours in this configuration. So uh, the point here is that it's not just you know, a, a figment of uh, your numerical model's imagination. It really is a observable uh, thing that occurs quite often in the, uh, in the, in the season for uh, thunderstorms when the conditions are right. Uh, so here's a basic uh, uh, outline. You know, back in the, uh, in the uh, oh, I guess in the early 60s, um, people started doing uh, um, more systematic observations of these supercell thunderstorms from the ground level. It was one of the unintended uh, consequences of the, uh, of the interstate highway system built by you know, the Eisenhower administration back in the 50s um, uh, that uh, you can get, get around pretty easily with the inter interstate highway. So people stand in their heads, well, why don't we just try to you know, follow a storm and see what, you know, what they look, what are, what are the, uh, the persistent uh, characteristics? You know, what are the things that happen all the time? And what are the things that are just, you know, case by case? So over time, this picture emerged of the, uh, of the supercell storm, uh, one where you, this is a view looking, uh, let's see, this is east, west, looking, and you, East, west. I guess you're looking north here, um, where you, the typical storm has this, these striations that uh, indicate rotation. Uh, there is an anvil 
out the top. There's an overshooting top into the stratosphere here. Uh, sometimes you see mammatus underneath the anvils. Uh, if a tornado was going to occur, it usually occurs right here between the rainy part, which is you know, displaced into the page, and the, uh, and, the, and the inflow, which is kind of coming from your back here. And uh, this is where the tornado forms if uh, there's going to be a tornado. So this, uh, this picture goes back to the first, the first indications of, of this systematic picture was back in the 1960s. And the 1970s, it was pretty well established due to many uh, people going out and uh, making systematic observations, you know, eyewitness observations of uh, thunderstorms. Uh, one of the, uh, in, in the mid-70s, uh, the computers became big enough and uh, our, our, uh, to, to run three-dimensional models of, uh, of cumulus convection. And at the same time, uh, the other innovation at that time was uh, dual Doppler radar. So um, it became possible in the late 70s to scan thunderstorms with radars map out the velocity distribution in 3D and in time, and compare it to the output of numerical models. And, at that, and this is the late 1970s. So at that point, that was sort of a uh, significant uh, uh, historical point, because for the first time we could actually uh, you know, see if the numerical models were getting anything like what the observations showed, because there were no observations of this sort of uh, completeness before the 1970s. So uh, I'm going to take you through a little tour, an abbreviated tour. But one of the uh, one of the key uh, clues to to understanding these supercell thunderstorms was the fact that they uh, sometimes split into two. And I'm going to show you. I'm going you know, to point out here's a storm complex here. Uh, let's, let's see if we can get to go, go again. How do I get it to repeat, uh, uh, Diego? Let me go back. Oh, I see, and then, I uh, yeah. Okay, so here is a, uh, here's the storms. See, see it's splitting into two, splitting into two. And that provided a clue uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Joe Clamp and Bob Williamson about uh, how, how, how these rotating storms uh, develop from basically nothing. There was a lot of, you know, uncertainty back then about horizontal inhomogeneity in the environment. But they were running uh, simulations with a uh, vertical wind shear with a horizontally homogeneous environment. There was no, no cold fronts, no, uh, no, uh, no pre-existing differences from one XY location to another XY location. So uh, this is the picture that uh, sort of uh, came together from all that research. Uh, one of the, the basic ingredients of uh, supercell thunderstorms is that they form in a shear flow. So here's a, uh, here's a uh, de shear flow. The, 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 le the depth layer here is about five kilometers and uh, constant above in this case. And associated with a shear flow is a vortex line. In this case, you take your, thing, you take your thumb, your right hand, and run it along the purple line and you'll get the sense of rotation. And uh, as the updraft grows in the shear, you know, just like a regular cumulus cloud, it's growing because it's releasing latent heat, and um, it's lifting that vortex line into sort of like a, uh, a hairpin. And uh, in so doing, it starts creating rotation on the flanks of the elemental cell. That rotation on the flanks has a effect on the pressure field, you know, rotating Rotating wind fields have low pressure at the center. So that low pressure at the center uh, implies a vertical pressure gradient force on the flanks of the, of the original cell. And what that does tends to do is promote new updrafts on the left and the right side of the original cell. So in the next uh, phase of the evolution, we take that, 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 that point and consider it further and now the rain starts falling in the middle of the axis. The, uh, the cells start uh, growing on the left and the right side. And you have a, uh, basically the elementary uh, process of storm splitting in this cartoon. And due to the, uh, the fact that the shear is, is in the same direction, doesn't change direction with height, 
then the uh, elementary cell that, we, that was started out with it was symmetric it maintains this, it ma maintains this uh, mirror symmetry uh, so what we have here is a if you're facing in the east direction which would be over here uh, a right moving cyclonically rotating updraft and in the uh, left direction you know in the northern side here we have a left moving anticyclonic ro rotating updraft as in those observations um, so this is sort of the, the basic elemental uh, picture of uh, storm splitting and the development of the supercell thunderstorm towards its uh, its mature phase. Now here's and you might say, well, we don't always observe sp storm splitting, and we don't always observe uh, symmetric pairs of rotating uh, storms left and right. Uh, and uh, one of the things we came across in doing this research back in the 80s was that if the uh, if the uh, the wind shear uh, varies, the wind shear turns with height, veers with height, you know, turns to the right as you go upward, and that's hard to depict on a single. Whoops, that's hard to depict on a single. Uh, go back. There we go. That's hard to depict on a single pole here. But this is a, this is a representation of the wind field in. Uh, with that, where, where the shear vector, if you just connect these arrows, turns with height. And in that case, um, for reasons that uh, we covered in some of our early articles, um, the, the rightward moving storm is biased. It tends to enhance the rightward moving storm and, and uh, suppress the, uh, the leftward moving st storm. Um, yeah, so let me uh, put this into motion. Yeah, so this is uh, the... Uh, this is that picture of the uh, of the observed supercell, and here's the evolution of a uh, of an elementary uh, supercell with a with a uh, with one of these veering shear profiles. And I, sh I should add, the climatology of uh, of these storms is with a, a curved photograph, a veering shear profile, so that things seem to add up. I'll play it again. So there's the, the original cells tilting up those low-level vortex lines. The, uh, the rotating storm on the right side is enhanced. The one on the left side is suppressed. And uh, we start taking the form of a, uh, of a rotating. So basically, if you move in the frame of reference with this, uh, uh, with, this, with this storm that's propagating to the south here, you'll have your basic rotating uh, thunderstorm. One of the other things that uh, has been uh, that was discovered then, and is still a very uh, a very hot topic in uh, in uh, research, is the formation of tornadoes in a uh, in in in, uh, in this area here. There's a a lot of you know when you do numerical modeling, any kind of modeling, there's a compromise has to be made. Some things have to some things you'll include and some things you won't include. And the reason is, you know, for you know, computational expense. So most of these models here were run with one or one two-kilometer resolution, uh, very simple uh, free-slip kind of conditions here. And uh, you know, a tornado could be 100 meters. So tornadoes are way below the resolution of of these kind of models. But now people are running uh, nested grids, very high resolution, and. Uh, and trying to include the effect of surface friction because we know that's important from laboratory work and creating very intense vortices. So uh, let me talk a little bit about collections of these of these systems because uh, then you know the, sort of in the 1990s uh, work went on to uh, understanding what collections of, of such you know of these elemental uh, thunderstorms and. Uh, Here's an example of a squall line, which is basically a line of thunderstorms. And I'm going to point it out to you here. It's going to keep on repeating. This is a squall line. It could be these distances here are many hundreds of kilometers. So there's a line of convection here, many hundreds of kilometers long, and just you know basically the the width of the uh, of the system is only you know, 50, 50 or 100 kilometers. So these lines uh, developed, you can see they develop from small groups of cells and then they sort of extend 
And in this case here, they start forming a, a rotation on the northern end. And I'll let you watch that one, one, one more time. Okay, so this is, uh, in, case you, in case I didn't mention it, this is uh, radar reflectivity. This is a mosaic of, of um, radar re reflectivities from vari these various stations around the country, around the USA. Yeah, so here's that last frame uh, showing that uh, in some of the, when some of these cases last long enough, you could have a uh, rotation on the northern end of the convective system. So uh, looking at the uh, sort of basis uh, of this in a very simple way, uh, in the 1990s, uh, folks started doing uh, uh, squall lines, but with three dimensions, with, with ends on the, on, on the squall lines. The earlier work that was done by, by us and many other groups was done with assuming periodicity in the north-south direction. Now here, you know, sort of the next step in complexity that you could do with a three-dimensional model is having uh, uh, ends on the line. And without the Coriolis force, you tend to form a, uh, a squall line. Uh, but the squall line uh, tends to concentrate itself into this bow shape. And uh, there's been pa some papers written on uh, this is the origin of uh, uncertain conditions of uh, what they call a bow echo. So as you can see, it has a, has a bow, bow shape by the time it gets to the end of the six hour integration. So what we're looking at here, the colored fields are, uh, are rainwater. Uh, w is in the contour, so showing an updraft, the leading edge of, the, uh, of this simulation. And these are the wind, wind vectors here at two kilometers. Okay, but the uh, sort of the, but when you put the Coriolis force in, even though it's, it, it, it seems to be a tiny effect for running a simulation for an hour or two for an you know, uh, elemental cell, over time, uh, we start developing enough, over six hours is enough time for the Coriolis effect to start biasing uh, one end uh, versus the other. And you see here that in this, in, again, the elementary si simulations, we start developing uh, rotation on the uh, northern flank of the storm. And this is and this is a well-known feature of uh, of uh, mid-latitude convection. This is a paper, a review paper by Bob Howes in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. Very classified systems. He called them the symmetric, where you, don't, you basically have this sort of a symmetric north-south squall line uh, versus anti what you call <coughs> asymmetric where you start developing rotation, cyclonic rotation on the northern tip. No, just constant Coriolis. Yeah, we, we can go into, I see you have a nice whiteboard here, so I can answer some questions in detail later about the, how that works, but it's basically that the, the conversion, this is ba and this occurs at the above cold pool level. This is not a surface. This is a swirling flow at about 700 millibars because that's the low, that's the flow of uh, the level of convergence into the convection. So that level of convergence is basically spinning up by the Coriolis force. There's deflections like this around the, around the convection. Yeah, the surface typically there's a, there's a surface uh, anticyclone because of the spreading air. But this is what you see on the radar. This is, this is what's directing the cells to go into a swirl. Yeah, once you develop, uh, once you develop that, uh, that um, rotation, it has an interesting property that it, uh, it can uh, create a potential, vort something called potential vorticity. And this can last uh, long, long after the lifetime of the convection. So here's a two day episode. This is, uh, if you're, if you're living down there, you'd think it was sort of a repeat offender. But one of the reasons they become repeat offenders is that the convection dies out night, during the nighttime, and then next, th next day with daytime heating, there's lifting associated with these uh, PV anomalies, and they keep on producing convection. And these episodes could last for several days and, uh, and just keep on propagating along.
What's the, what's the level of the, of the anomaly? The or so? Or? The level, yeah, right, it's right between 7 and 5. All right, so let's get to uh, you know, numerical prediction. How do, you know, how do you predict such things? Because, uh, let me just, uh, so there, there's our elementary cell. There's its uh, big cumulus cloud, and we want to be able to predict uh, such things. And uh, nowadays we have the capability to, to use one kilometer resolution and, uh, and run a forecast out 48 hours you know, in real time. So, um, what should we expect out of such uh, simulations? So, um, in the numerical modeling of uh, these uh, of these uh, storms, you know, or or, si or weather, I should say, more generally, weather situations that have the possibility of having these storms, uh, there are a few sort of a gray zone, what they call gray zones or uh, terra incognita. Um, if you have a grid resolution that's on the order of 10 kilometers or larger, uh, you're probably in, in the zone where, where a cumulus parameterization would help you out. Because obviously, if I have a 10 kilometer grid and the minimum resolve scale is four to six times uh, 10 delta X, you know, t times delta X, then uh, the minimum resolve scale could be as like a, a 40 kilometer big cumulus cloud, which is not observed. Right, so so you have to sort of resort to something in, in this uh, regime here to represent the effects of cumulus convection. Um, PBL parameterizations, uh, we think you can probably uh, use them safely into the several kilometer range. But then we have these gaps in here. We don't quite know what to do. And so the tendency is trying to skip over these gaps. So we, you know, run uh, models now with with, uh, without cumulus parameterization, but in the one to two kilometer category. So at least one gap has been, uh, has been filled. So it permits convection, but you really can't say you're resolving it unless you're actually resolving all the little turbulent eddies in here. Because they are, all these eddies are falling below the, the resolution of the, of the grid. And they're important because they, they tell you how how, how stuff entrains and how stuff detrains. And so all of the entrainment and detrainment on this kind of one kilometer grid is coming through a parameterization. It's coming through a representation of what you think uh, these local conditions will, you know, how much mixing will come from them. The thing you do get at this resolution is the over, you know, basically the, the larger scales of circulation in this, uh, in this um, elementary uh, object. Okay, so um, in the uh, the the, uh, the mesoscale model that we use at, at the NCAR and it's, it's developed uh, in our shop, but also with a, a wide collaboration with the university and government uh, folks, uh, the WARF uh, model, the weather research and forecasting model, was developed in our, so that if you increase resolution, you can you can do a uh, bandular uh, simulation. This is this is with the uh, 50 uh, 50 meter resolution. This should be an X over here. Um, this is a supercell thunderstorm simulation of the type I was just describing to you. Uh, mountain waves, where you need to have enough resolution to uh, to uh, simulate the sort of the, the the most important scales in a in a, in a mountain range, all the way up to uh, you know the scale, the scales that are pertinent to uh, you know synoptic scale weather systems like uh, like baroclinic waves. There's an example of a simulation of a baroclinic wave cyclone. So uh, the way it's done, the, the way this was done 10 years ago, I'm, but I'm giving you here is sort of the first our first attempts back in 2003. This is uh, we had the observations. Uh, the data, we had static initialization, 3D VAR for data simulation, uh, and then it would get fed into the core over here. And then uh, Shua uh, was here back in those days, right? Was back in Colorado, back at close to the beginning, right? That's not where he left. Where he left. So you're before this time. Before that, 
Yeah, okay. Time flies, right? <laughs> anyway, so this was, we were doing, uh, 2003, we were able to do real-time forecasts uh, with this system. I think it was a very crude uh, resolution. It was four kilometer resolution. And uh, so uh, these are the questions that we come, come, come up against. How much resolution does it take? Is four kilometers good enough? So how much resolution does it take to simulate squall lines and bow echoes? Uh, here's a case of, uh, there was a field experiment, BAMEX, uh, specifically uh, done to, uh, to measure the internal uh, structure of these uh, bow echoes and mesoscale systems. Uh, here is a, a real-time forecast at four kilometers. Here's a real-time forecast at two kilometers. I think you could argue that there was a better, you know, somewhat better uh, uh, depiction of the event at two kilometers. What about a supercell? As I said, a supercell, we, we did the initial stuff at one kilometer. Uh, here's, uh, here's some examples. Again, a four kilometer uh, simulation using the same system. Here's a two kilometer system showing that uh, you start uh, defining, uh, get better definition of the supercells uh, as you uh, go to higher resolution. Unfortunately, in this case, no supercells were observed out here. So <laughs> it, was, it was a good forecast. If they, had, if they had only developed, it would have been a good, uh, good, good structural forecast. So these are sort of the, you know, and then for tornado, I'd say at this point, forget about it. It's not, we're not there yet. So uh, this brings us into the world of uh, the, the science of predictability. Uh, you, you really have to uh, confront the, the issues of predictability if you're going to try to um, forecast thunderstorms one day or two days in advance. Now we know from the, uh, the, the fundamental work of Ed Lorenz in the 1960s that there's a limit uh, to, 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 uh, to, 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 to the time over which you can get a skillful uh, prediction. And so, for example, here we have thunder on the thunderstorm scale, it might be of a size of 50 kilometers for the whole thunderstorm complex. Um, uh, the you know, current skill might be an hour or so, a couple of hours, if you initialize it. But we know there's a limit up here in the blue line. We don't know where that is yet, but we know it's there. And that's the same for the tornado, hurricane, all these different things. We know there's a limit out here uh, for the, you know, and the idea is that, from Lorenz, is that you can make your model more and more perfect, and you can make your data simulation system more and more perfect, but there's always a fundamental instability that will, that will put you, you know, off, the, off the path of the, uh, of the real atmosphere, and that will limit your predictability. Okay, so there's, there's a kind of a whole science behind predictability, and we could talk about that at length if anybody's interested. But uh, here's one uh, contribution. We had a postdoc at NCAR, Fuching Zhang, back in the early 2000s. He did this, uh, for, at its time, very state-of-the-art kind of a study. We did a, a, a baroclinic wave with embedded moist convection. And here is the, uh, here is the parent domain, 90 kilometer, a, a smaller domain at 30 kilometers. And then we had this inner domain at 3.3 kilometers. So this is just on the on the uh, on the doorstep, uh, being able to uh, permit convection. So we had a baroclinic wave with a distribution of unstable, moist instability in the uh, in the wave. It doesn't come out very clearly here, but this is the low pressure system here, developing on this baroclinic, uh, barically on this baroclinically unstable. Uh, um, distribution. So what I'm going to show you in the next step is uh, we ran two simulations uh, and uh, the, in one simulation was perturbed with random noise and the other one wasn't. And then I'm going to show you the difference in the uh, in, 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 uh, in one of the components, this is the B component here, in the blue and red. So we could think of it like this: if you have a if you have a forecast for a thunderstorm, uh, and in one one version of the forecast, the thunderstorm is say on my right hand, 
in another version of the forecast, due to the perturbation, the storm pops up in my left hand. I take the difference between those two forecasts and I'll get a red and a blue spot because you know it's, it, it's just the difference between the two forecasts. And the idea of Lorenz is that uh, these, uh, these differences, uh, they grow both in scale and in amplitude until you ultimately corrupt the larger scale system. So you basically you run out of, uh, yeah, so, so it's your predictability ultimately is limited because of uh, having things that grow uh, at, um, whose, whose, whose rate of growth is proportional to the scale of the, of the, uh, of the disturbance. So and then this is this is one of the things about convection. It is just just such a system. The smaller the scale, the faster the growth. You know, and, and for example, large scale dynamics, bar, you know, barotropic, baroclinic waves, they all have the same scale. All scales have the same time scale. We can work it out on the board, but it's, but it's it's not that hard. So this is the evolution. Three hours. Six hours, twelve hours. You can see, and it's it's basically uh, fulfilling the uh, the prophecy of Ed Lorenz that it's uh, it's growing upscale and in, in amplitude until you start start starting to shift around the uh, uh, the, me the mesoscale features of the baroclinic wave. So uh, this was a what, this, one of the forecasts back then. This is the SPCs, the Storm Prediction Center's uh, storm reports. This is on the, uh, you have to read this American style. This is June 4th. Um, and these are the reports of high winds, some tornadoes in red, hail in, uh, in green. And uh, this was the synoptic situation from the 300 millibars. There was a, uh, a, a synoptic scale wave. The colors are the isotacks showing strong winds coming around a deep trough in the central U.S. Here's Texas. And the severe weather was out in here. So uh, the, uh, yeah, so the forecast and let's see, uh, so this, uh, so this is, this is an example of the, of the reflectivity forecast on the left and the uh, next rad composite on the right. And I forgot, you told me how to, how to start this. Um, oh, yeah. Click it to the right, that doesn't work. Okay. No. I, I got to click on the figure. Maybe it's one of these. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so this is, this is going to... Okay. Here it goes. Okay, so... Uh, I want you to keep your eye out what happens here. Stop it at 24. Yeah, I, I, don't have, I don't have control over here. No? Yeah. Could you run that again? Yes. And stop it at uh, 24 hours. So the forecast is going to run starting at zero here. And now it quickly develops the pattern. It's a cold start. doesn't know anything about the convection. But then it develops it. Stop there. We can see the forecast here predicts the squall line at more or less the right spot uh, as observed. Now this is 24 hours in advance, and according to the theory of Lorenz, and you are not able to predict the individual location of any any thunderstorm. That's that's completely reasonable, but the larger scales that are in the initialization they have a longer predictability horizon. So the larger scales, uh, so so the so the ability to predict such things at longer lead times uh, is, is inherited by the predictability of the longer scales. So there's, uh, um, there's a lot of uh, role here for things like data simulation to try and really better define, not the small scales, because we know the small scales are really not predictable, or at least not for very long, but, but the, 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 the larger mesoscale contains information, useful information that can, can give you things like this, where it'll tell you, okay, in uh, 24 hours you will have, uh, you will have a line of, you have the possibility of a line of convection in this place uh, at this time. 
So let's spin ahead to today. This is what, uh, if you want to see what happens uh, today, and uh, go to this website over here. This is called the NCAR Ensemble. Uh, this is now done at three kilometer grid spacing as daily forecast over the full uh, contiguous uh, United States, convection allowing. And this does an ensemble because as, as we were talking about in terms of predictability, the, the fundamental thing you're trying to predict is, is a stochastic process. It, 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 has, it has a random element to it. And so to try to characterize uh, the, um, the, 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 the probability of, uh, of, these, uh, of these events, uh, it's been found that, that the ensemble approach is, is probably the most viable. And the ensemble approach is basically taking 10 versions of the forecast, starting with slightly different initial conditions, running them forward, and then looking at sort of the average in some sense, which I'll describe, uh, in some sense the average of the forecast. So let me, uh, let me show you an example here. This is an example of the sort of data that goes into it. So there's lots of surface data here. There's, there's uh, I don't know if you could read this stuff in the bottom. But this A's car, this is airplane, you know, commercial air, aircraft data, satellite data, uh, surface stations, method. It all goes feeding into one great big, great big uh, com you know, computer data simulation system, and uh, and then um, and then uh, there's a 50 member continuously cycled analysis on a coarse grid, whereas they start at one time and they just keep on. You never restart it. It just keeps on going with new information being put in. So that the so that the model solution is sort of self-consistent, and every time it starts drifting off track away from the atmosphere, new data comes in every six hours or so. So this is this is the idea of a continuously cycled uh, uh, using this technique of the ensemble Kalman filter. So uh, this is an example. This here's here's a uh, here's a uh, a fork here's a forecast. Of, 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 so here, here's an observation. Here's the, here's the radar reflectivity, and I, I should say that you know we haven't really you know the field we the field has not really settled on the best way to depict these uh, these probabilistic forecasts. Uh, so this is one example that I think is is kind of intuitive. So in this case here, this is the uh, this is the squall line. These are the individual cells, and this is a uh, we're going to try to forecast this some twenty hours in advance. So let's try to forecast the uh, 45 dBZ contour only. So if you take one ensemble member, but this is the version of that forecast. This is a uh, nine hour forecast for, the, for that same 45 dBZ um, contour. Now if I take another, for, another member, it's that one. And if I take all the members, it's that one. And if you average them together, it's this one. And it gives you a crude uh, probability distribution of the probability of having a 45 dBZ echo in this, uh, along, this along this line. Um, there, are other, there, there are many, maybe infinitely many ways of, uh, of coming up with the probability measures. And so it's still sort of an experimental thing right now, see what, what works best. But this one seems to have some skill in that um, they're finding that, uh, for example, in this case, um, this was the probability distribution and uh, of, uh, of something called updraft helicity. And helicity is, is, is just a measure, you don't have to know what it is really, but it's, it's, it's just a measure of th thunderstorm rotation. So how is the model, you know, the convective elements that the model's forecasting, are they rotating a lot or are they rotating a little? So uh, this is the uh, probability map of, uh, of, uh, of for this particular day, uh, and here are the storm reports, and I think it's, you know, my opinion, it's it's pretty good. Anyway, you know, there so there are some here that occurred that were not at zero probability, uh, here and here, and uh, but on on the whole, it's uh, it's it's better than uh, it's better than where we are t you know today, so it's um, it shows a lot of promise. So anyway, uh, to, su to summarize, something went wrong here. Uh, summarize what we talked about here was uh, going back to the early elements of of, uh, of severe convection, the elementary uh, convective cell, how wind shear determines uh, whether it'll keep on regenerating itself or not. That's sort of a squall line 
idea, uh, or whether or not a, a certain special cell, a supercell, would be created. Um, from there, we talked about uh, groups of cells, systems, squall lines, mesoscale convective vortices, and, uh, and the special properties of those when they act in concert uh, with one another. And then finally, uh, I took you into the uh, sort of the modern day research on how to forecast thunderstorms uh, using uh, mesoscale models uh, that are run at convection permitting um, uh, resolutions uh, using modern uh, data simulation systems and ensemble techniques. So with that, I'll end and uh, take questions. Well, thank you very much for a very interesting talk.